Okay, our next uh, sort of keynote launch speaker is uh, Dr. Francis Omaswa, who's the Executive Director of the African Center for Global Health and Social Transformation called ACHEST in uh, Kampala, Uganda. And uh, Dr. Omaswa uh, brings a sort of unique perspective here. He's managed uh, in multiple sectors and organizations. Uh, he has been the Secretary General of the Ugandan Ministry of Health. Um, was the founding director of the Global Health Workforce Alliance, working with the World Health Organization. Um, also was the um, founding chair of the Global Stop TB Partnership and a member of the steering committee of the High Level Forum on Health-Related MDGs, as well as part of the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, and now is uh, leading his own NGO um, in Uganda. So uh, we've asked him to talk about uh, the role of public-private partnerships in improving global health and safety um, within uh, low- and middle-income countries, and obviously, especially uh, in the African context, which I think we talked a little bit about yesterday in terms of the um, kind of seizing the ownership. We've talked about mindset of corporate change. Um, I think Francis has also been articulate about the need of mindset in low- and middle-income countries in terms of engaging in partnerships. So, Dr. Omaswa. Thank you, Joe, for the, that introduction. Um, and also, thank you for the invitation to come and speak here. I acknowledge Sir George Alain. Good to see you again. Um, I got the invitation to come and speak here soon after my induction into the IOM. And uh, on the induction morning, well, Victor Zhao talked to us and said, we expect two things from you, your time and money. So I immediately saw that this was a serious matter. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I, I better respond. Uh, so here I am. Nice to be back here and nice to see all of you. So uh, um, many of the points that I'll be making are similar to those which were made by Laura, but presented probably in a different way. We will discuss under four headings, uh, why are we doing this? And speaking from uh, uh, Africa, we still have very, very uh, serious uh, challenges there with poor health status of the people and very poor access to basic health care. Uh, I will not spend time, uh, much time on partnerships, but I will speak more on ownership and accountability. And then we'll share some examples and discuss how we might go forward together. What's that? What have I done? Like that. So context. This is really why are we doing this? It's about the inequalities that there are in our world today. We have very connected, globalized world. We have knowledge, we have resources, but up to now, we are still lacking the will to address those inequalities. There are challenges of how we govern our societies, and we really the spirit that has brought us here is about bridging that gap, making the quality of life and dignity of all individuals the same. And it is possible. And what I hope is that you and many of us out there are working to create a climate of opinion. This is a, a, a statement from a, a leading TB guru Basically, that nothing important ever happens until the climate of opinion is right. And to address that inequality, to produce equity and social justice, is really going to call for movements to the same scale as those we put together to deal with uh, things like apartheid, slavery, colonialism, and all this. And this is what it is all about. And this is as good a time as an, another, and I'm 
uh, pleased that I'm able to come and share with you and uh, get more momentum on this movement. So here, I will just speak to the uh, highlighted uh, sentence below there, healthcare versus health promotion and health for all. Um, we are all born healthy by and large. A few people are born with congenital malformations and we can live in good health provided that we protect our health. But the discussion on health needs, health wants, and so on is a, quite often a struggle between health care and health promotion. Very often we address our, we, we take health care as what is really the, the more important, yet keeping people healthy is probably the more important. So when we are talking about PPPs, let's not only think about treating those who have become ill, but also preventing those who are well from becoming ill. And the balance between these two is a permanent challenge, particularly for governments and health, uh, and health providers. This is a study, but, uh, poverty, participatory poverty assessment studies, which are carried out routinely in many of our uh, low-income countries. Uh, this one was asking people in Uganda in 2002, why are you poor? And the majority of them would say ill health, poor health contributes to my poverty. You ask the question the other way around, sorry that you are poor, what is likely to happen to you next? The majority again will say somehow I'm going to get ill and die. So the poor people themselves, uh, not unsurprisingly, value health very much indeed. And some of them, it is their health which may be the only key asset that they have. They rent it out daily. They come back through the market with what they have earned and go back home to put food on the table. If they are ill, catastrophe has befallen them. So in uh, discussing and understanding how we might work together, I think it will help us as part of our discussion on context to appreciate, have a common vision of what a health system looks like. Now, this uh, schema is uh, taken from a study Dr. Bafford and I did uh, five years ago, a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, to look at what the needs of ministers of health are and the people who work closely with ministers. So we then defined a health system as consisting of uh, population health, that is uh, uh, public health. We also put in health research uh, and health in all policies. And we have lately added health workforce to this in uh, a guideline we have produced for health ministers in May this year. So as we look at health needs and how to respond to them, it is helpful to have this at the back of our minds. This also is from that same study. It is published under the title of uh, Strong Ministries for Strong Health Systems by Dr. Bafford and I. And this is what we perceive to be the environment in which a health a system in a country works. Uh, you have uh, the minister there. Mm, this one is, you, you, you see in the red, the Minister of Health and the staff with whom they work. On the right-hand side, other members of the uh, government, Minister of Finance, Environment, Agriculture, local government, and so on. And they also have regulators. But in the overall, that's a very, very important uh, group of actors there. We have business there. We have universities, academia think tanks, NGOs, civil society, research institutes, donors, professional associations. So our recommendation is that while government is critical, there are things in the health of the population which government cannot delegate. But government alone is not enough. Government 
needs to work increasingly with this array of other actors to produce the evidence that is needed to support in the implementation. Government doesn't even have to deliver health, can delegate to others, but must make sure that population health is addressed. And these groups should work together in a spirit of inform and inspire rather than name and shame. Certainly in Africa, we find this to be very important. If you set off as a, like a think tank or an academic or a civil society to attack your government in the press or where you have failed to do this, 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 you are very unlikely to get their audience, even if your ideas are good. But if you are able to put your information together, uh, you seek an uh, appointment with a minister or even a head of state, and you whisper to them almost, say, look, what, what about this? How do we take this forward? You will find they come out and speak as if they are the owners of the ideas and implement them as theirs. Nothing wrong at all. I have no problem with that. So this is, uh, 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 if we are talking about partnerships, uh, a, a very useful schema. We also have the global organizations and regional uh, organizations, and they are there, like in uh, Africa, for example. We have the African Union. We have then uh, regional economic communities in East, Afri East Africa, West Africa. These are also intergovernmental bodies, which actually are potential partners to work with in the future. We are back again to the institutions in the OVO. Uh, after the study on strong ministries, we went to five countries in Africa and looked for those institutions which are outside government but are available to work with governments. These are now consolidated for Kenya, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, and Mali. Those are the countries that we studied. So the point here is that these institutions actually exist in the countries. So if you are looking for partners, they are there waiting for you and a wide range of them, including business and the private sector, as you can see. So we move on to other key players. Uh, and we've talked about national governments. Then they are both from the rich countries and the poor countries, and they are development agencies. These are the ones we are working with all the time. There's the UN family who are also very important actors in our countries. Uh, and then there are global health initiatives, Stop TB, uh, Roll Back Malaria, the Global Fund, Gavi, and so on. And the philanthropy is also with us. We are doing quite many things with them, as you will see later, including the pharmaceuticals and the I, the groups in the OVO, uh, we called them in the report health resource partner institutions, but they are non-government organizations. At the bottom is the youth. That's a very important group, a very important group. As we think about developing partnerships for the future, we should be looking to support young people who want to go and live in countries other than their own, in societies other than their own. Because it's these exposures that stimulate in them this global spirit. And when they grow up later to become leaders, their early experience in countries other than their own uh, 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 makes them uh, uh, inclined to be international people, the common good it, uh, uh, individuals internationally. So now uh, Africa. Specifically, my mandate was low and middle income countries, but I will be speaking largely about Africa. Africa, we started very well indeed as we got our independence. It was very hopeful. Then things went wrong for various reasons. And in the year 2000, this is The Economist, it published an article called Hopeless Africa. That Africa has changed the last 10, 15, 20 years. Africa is different mainly because of, I think, two things. One, the demise of the Cold War. It made impunity possible for many of our leaders. And then two, the organization of African unity transformed into African Union. The African Union now does, uh, holds zero tolerance 
for illegitimacy. You can't take power by force and sit with the others. And then three, the movement on social justice and equity, those meetings in Beijing, Cairo, human rights, and then women's rights, and so on. If you uh, uh, commit crimes, there is a court in The Hague uh, where you can be taken to. All those things have combined to bring stability to Africa, and our economies are growing. Wherever you go, there are traffic jams, and traffic jams basically are telling you more people are driving cars. And, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, those cities, you would walk in them, people are listless, the shops are shut, self-imposed curfews. So we have a new Africa with us today, which is more hopeful and which has potential to be a market and to be a destination for investment. But poverty is still a big issue in Africa. This is uh, from the WHO Regional Office for Africa. I think there was talk about uh, uh, in 15% uh, on health investment by African heads of state. Very few countries are spending much money on health. In your country here, I think you are sort of like 4,000 and beyond per capita expenditure on health. We are still there, less than 20, but all of them less than 50. So the investment in health is still a big issue in Africa. So let's now talk about public-private partnerships. I will not go much into the definitions because you know this already, uh, but uh, the point I would like to make here uh, is that um, public-private partnerships is, I think, a given. It's been happening to some extent all along, different levels of it. But I think what we are discussing today is putting this on the table as a matter of an essential agenda for health development in the countries. In the past, perhaps government would hesitate to approach a, a, a farmer, but we are now talking about a new mindset which tells us that the public sector and the private sector are all about the common good, about the, uh, the, the uh, uh, social justice, equity, and so on, and they should not be left on the side or have any hesitations about dealing with them. Uh, WHO has also has started now to look at this matter in a different way. Uh, they, uh, uh, has, uh, there is an active discussion now about the so-called non-state actors. And these are those things in the oval, those groups in the oval that I showed you. They are becoming part and parcel of global health system. The private for-profit sector is also uh, more and more getting accepted as a key player in uh, global health by the governments of the world. So we are uh, going in the right direction. Um, the opportunities are there. Again, here we uh, certainly uh, uh, know that the private sector has skills which governments don't have, which the public sector doesn't have. But if we bring all this together, then we then the shared value that we talked about uh, will be so much strengthened. And we should not be shy about being open and frank with each other. And there are comparative advantages. There are things which public sectors can do well. There are things which the private sector can do well. There are things which civil society can do well. And we should be prepared as we design our health system to find a place for all the players without any hesitation at all. And those are the ones where uh, we uh, have uh, roles for each party, um, product development, supply chain management, marketing, distribution. On the other hand, it is only the public sector is able to go to parliament and make laws and uh, enforce also the laws through the various law enforcement agencies. So together, we can make a powerful team moving together. But of course, these are the traditional concerns which are there 
about the, the private sector. Conflicts of interest, uh, some of the donations in kind, we just you know, throw them away there and say it is up to you. They expire on your shelves, but say I've done my part, but I'll show you in a moment how some of the, the donations are being uh, managed well uh, through and uh, not just throwing them out there. Uh, and uh, I think these are the selectivities which uh, uh, the participant uh, on the other side there was asking uh, Laura about. Um, and um, uh, working through the system, working through the health system. Health system is uh, not as complicated as it is. It, but if we bypass it, then we get into trouble sooner or later. You want to take shortcuts instead of working through an established health system, repairing the, the shortcomings that are there instead of bypassing them. Over time, you get a system which actually works and to which we are all part of. So let me just talk about uh, uh, ownership. I already discussed the common good and equity and social justice and so on. If we are going to partner with communities, and we'll come back to this again later, the point which was raised here, say so where are the communities? It is crit crit critical. What are the needs? What are the wants? This should come from working with the communities, identifying their needs with them, by them, listening to them. Because if you give me something because you think you have it and I don't have it, but in fact I know inside me I don't really need it, I don't want it, but since you are giving it to me and I can use it, okay, you bring it. When you go away, I throw it away as well. So uh, ownership is about the beneficiary feeling that this is mine, this is what I want. And it is endogenous, it comes from inside. It is not like given. Yes, there's something called unfelt need, but still you have to persuade the recipient that they actually uh, need this. And till they say, this is mine, I want it, let's do it together. So that is a very, very important point indeed. Some illustrative examples. From my experience in Uganda, these are some of the things I did uh, working in the Ministry of Health. Designing the service delivery, some of the not-for-profit and some for-profit health facilities also would be assigned a role in a geographical area to deliver health services in that place. And uh, it worked very well. Uh, uh, some of those facilities, they were started by missionaries a long time ago. The missionaries now don't send them money but the government now gives them money and do an MOU with them. Uh, with the farmer in Uganda, we introduced home-based management of fevers. So the, the pharmaceutical companies packaged anti-malarial drugs, one package for children under two, another for children under five, and uh, this is called Homapak Homais fever in Swahili, and uh, that worked really very well indeed. We in Uganda, we have been able to control our uh, 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 river blindness with donations, as well as uh, also being uh, able to uh, uh, work with the GSK, GSK to have the supply chain integrated into the public sector supply chain. So those things are happening. I started the Uganda Heart Institute when the government of Uganda had no money. They just had, came out of a war, and with Rotary International, they gave a grant, uh, and uh, we uh, are now having that institution as a very strong institution in the country. It started with the government only paid the, our salaries. We were about five staff who started, and that's basically a PP thing with trading from friends in Italy and India. Pfizer has uh, built a terrific, beautiful center in Kampala, uh, Infectious Diseases Institute. Some of you know about this, and so on and so on. There are very many examples of PPP. I just want to talk to you about this mark. Just a month ago, 
they held a meeting in Frankfurt, and I was one of the speakers who was invited to go there. I arrived there, I reached the hall, 200 Africans. They wasn't quite aware that I was going to find the, uh, my, my fellow Africans there. And uh, they actually have got deliberate programs to make uh, access to their products available. They work directly with doctors, with universities, uh, in order to make sure that diabetes drugs and uh, uh, contraceptives and anti-cancer drugs, their drugs are properly managed, both by the private sector and the public sector. This, they say, is going to be done each, each year. There will be a meeting like this each year. Um, I will not spend more time on those. I think those are the global health initiatives. But you need to know about them if you are a private sector and you have a lot of money. It is one route for entering the partnership. Uh, like the Global Fund, uh, like Gavi, uh, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is one of the big contributors to this. And they also work. They produce common global goods in health. Here are some challenges that we face. A big implementation gap. Poor working conditions for staff. Weak institutions and governance issues in our own government, but also in the UN system. Some of the UN institutions need reviews of the way in which they are governed. And the last from the bottom, the second from the bottom, poor public demand for accountability is also a very important point. We are talking about what do the, the consumers want? What do they want? Are they asked? Many times they have given up. We are poor people. No one cares about us. You go to a health facility. There are no health workers. There are no drugs. You just turn your back and go and find another solution instead of uh, banging uh, your hand on the table or going to the law enforcement. People say, what's going on here? So public demand is very poor. And I think it's one of the things we need to build together so that accountability for all is ensured. So lessons. It's really a build, about building capacity. Capacity of governments and capacity of those institutions in the oval in the diagram there, professional associations of think tanks. And being specific and understanding each country's specificities, because the solutions come from the local, uh, local, local, local uh, um, situations, the culture, the history of the institution, and so on. You can't just transplant solutions and give them to, uh, to communities who don't understand them. And uh, the key interventions, locally driven research, management, leadership, and making sure that everything is well governed, all the institutions are well governed, sharing the information, networks, and making sure that the implementation gap is closed. Um, there is a book which, uh, together with the, uh, Lord Nigel Crisp, I have edited uh, and published just uh, uh, um, uh, two months ago. Two months ago, it's got contributions from 23 Africans. There is only one non-African among the editors, Lord Crispy. He helped me with uh, a number of things in getting the book done. And what is the message from this book? One, that there are Africans like me. There are very many of us. We could do much more than we are doing now for our people. We need a mindset, change ourselves. And that movement, we would like you to help us to, to go with. Then two, there are also Africans like me, and there's also Carol, there is also an, an African like me, who have done so much, so much, so much. Um, introducing like ARVs in Uganda. There's a guy called Peter Mugenyi. At a time when people here were saying, oh, Africans can't take ARVs, they tell the time by the sun, not by the clock, etc." That guy said, no, we can't do it. And, is uh, told this story in that book. 
Another guy whom I understand was almost invited or invited to come and speak here, Pascal Makumbi, Makumbi from uh, Mozambique. The Portuguese left his country together with all the doctors. He was the Minister of Health. So he trained clinical assistants, nurses, and so on to do cesarean sections. It worked so well. Other people are imitating it now. So yes, it is possible. There are people there who some of them should do more. Some are doing enough. And then together, the book is asking the international community, you people, to see us in a different way. Not as a continent just for global pity and so on, but as a continent where investment is possible, as a continent where you have actual partners with whom we can work together to, uh, 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 to, to bring social justice equity. And um, together, we should be able to create a global system that serves everyone. And we are asking the US private sector to come and invest in Africa. I understand even the returns on investment are higher in Africa than in many other countries. The Chinese have come in a very big way. They are all over the place, in every country. We would like to see you there also. We would like to uh, work together to promote the message of the common good. I think there are enough people around to help the world get out of its big problems, its complex problems, if we work together and to support us, those groups in the Oval. If you are wanting to invest, don't just invest in the governments, but also invest in those uh, groups of people. That's the book. And I end with this. We ended the last uh, presentation discussing how, how this is from uh, a friend from Thailand, Professor Panase, the triangle that moves the mountain. How do we move this mountain? First, at the bottom right, left-hand corner, is the people. What are the people's needs? How do we tell what they need, what they want? It is the knowledge generators, the think tanks, the universities, academia, and maybe private sector as well. So we should engage with the society, with the communities, to generate knowledge and solutions to their needs and their problems. And these are the ones we take to the politicians on the left-hand right corner. And in the ideal situation, the politicians, they allocate the money, they make many decisions. They should just be uh, you know, doing what these two have decided, if they want votes. And that is usually the way it is. So the discussion that we ended with, this is how I propose the answer to it is, if we get a partnership of global partnerships that generate knowledge, which is about solving society's needs, and it is this knowledge uh, this evidence and these solutions that we share with our politicians. And there is a good chance that we will have the better world, the one we are looking for, the one where there will be equity, social justice, and which will not be destroyed by overconsumption, et cetera, all those issues we talk about. So this is uh, uh, my presentation, and thank you very much indeed for listening to me. So why don't you, yeah, we have about, again, 10 minutes for questions. If you could uh, raise your tent cards or your hand and uh, advise who you are. Francis, you mentioned, let me pick up uh, while people are thinking. Um, you mentioned the issue of, and, and Laura mentioned the issue of community engagement and the challenges of community engagement. And as I recall, she also mentioned using um, international NGOs as a, a proxy for linking to government, and you mentioned NGOs. Could you talk a little bit about what, what are sort of credible mechanisms for, quote unquote, engaging the community? Because it can seem quite daunting, I think, as you're moving into this. And as you pointed out, if you're not patients, I mean, patients are relevant as well, but just your reflections on, on that issue from the point of view of really local um, intelligence about what's going on local context. Certainly speaking uh, about many African countries, most it's about reaching households, leaving no one behind. It is about a way in which the health system is able to, uh, uh, I, uh, to, 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 to work with uh, uh, 
individuals, households, and communities to address their health needs. Today, in most countries, there are NGOs there of one type or another. There are religious groups, particularly, they are there. And what is interesting also is that they are individuals. Uh, one time I visited my, I, I, I go there probably every month where uh, I, I, I grew up in Uganda. It's a rural place. There was a white person sitting in a veranda in one of the homes as I drove past. So I asked uh, the people who were with me in the car, what is that white man doing in that home? Say, oh, it's a, he's a friend of that family. Say, from where? He's from America. So what do they do together? They are friends. I think they belong to the same church. That is the answer which I got. So apart from these uh, big groups whom we are talking about here, there is also a lot going on at individual level. So your question, uh, uh, Joe, how actually can international NGOs get to know what the society needs? Uh, it is working through counterpart NGOs which are in our countries. And there are also many, uh, well, many, hmm, I don't know. They are the likes of the World Vision, for example. But CARE works there, but through proxies. And the proxies are usually ours. I mean, the, 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 the local NGOs. And many of these, at least in Uganda, are part of the health system. If, if you are working in health and you are big enough, you are co-opted into the district health team. And then what you are doing is part of the district health system. There's also the question of uh, channeling money. That also is a big issue. Uh, if you uh, decide to do something, to whom and how you, trans uh, you transfer the money is uh, also a major cause of either getting it right or getting it wrong. And uh, 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 what is the correct answer to that? Again, if you look properly in each country, there are enough SCOs, CSOs uh, to, to choose from. And uh, how are they governed? Do they have uh, boards of directors? Do they have uh, accounting systems and so on? And that's something which very often also is missed. You say you want to support an NGO, but supporting it also includes making sure that it has got capacity not just to deliver the technical work, but also to govern itself. And that is as important as the technical skills of the organization. Francis, you, in your final slide here, you talk about um, political involvement, and I agree that that is terribly important. But every now and again, the poli politicians can let us down appallingly. Um, Uganda, for example, um, over the past couple of years has had a terribly dark period with the draconian legislation that was introduced um, against homosexuals. Um, that certainly sent a lot of people, and myself included, in the international uh, community um, to look at the, the, the right or wrong of... Uh, sending funds, continuing to send funds to a country um, where that, that legislation was in place. And yet, of course, um, the people who need the help are those who can least um, stand up for themselves. Did you see any um, impact uh, from that legislation from many of the public-private partnership programs that, uh, um, that you've talked about today. You talked about one which has been a labor of love for me for many years with the Infectious Disease Institute mm. in Kampala. And uh, I just wondered if that particular um, uh, madness had had any impact on, on uh, uh, what you're trying to do in Uganda. Mm -hmm. I'll respond to you in uh, uh, two levels. First of all, how do we get our, the right leaders? The politicians uh, all over the world, they are, you know, they are what, how do we hold them accountable? The way I see it for Africa now is for the middle class in Africa, the in, uh, rising middle class with the economic growth to be more empowered, 
to do more for ourselves and for our people than we are doing now. And probably to do that through organized systems like the professional associations, like the think tanks, like the academies. Like. So we would want your support to strengthen these institutions of ours. And then the rest we have to do also ourselves. Then the second part of it in respect to that uh, 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 um, anti-homosexuality bill, it's very complicated, very complicated. When the bill was first signed by the president, I see my friend, uh, Dr. Roger uh, uh, Glass over there, he wrote to me and said, how can this happen when you are there in Uganda? What are you, what are you doing about it? This is very complicated. Because the person who drove the passage of that bill, it was a private member's bill. And from our information, his sponsors are from this country. So this is not as simple as uh, 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 we look at it. The president didn't want to sign the bill, but also seemed someone upset him, you know, telling him maybe in a way of not inform and uh, not infor inspire and inform and inspire, but in a way of name and shape. So he says, okay, if you think you are the big person here, let me show you. Um, the bill it was uh, technically uh, uh, removed from the statute bills because it was passed without a quorum. The court decided, but they are trying to bring it back again. And the people who are trying to bring it back again are not just Ugandans, but also some of them are from here and some other countries. Okay, quick questions. We have um, Kathy Taylor and Simon Bland, and then we'll wrap for our break. Hi, thank you for that wonderful talk. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, connect your talk and Laura's talk um, with the idea of the, you know, the collective impact and the common agenda. And the, and I worry, you know, having worked in Kenya for many years and, and seeing in Haiti and seeing the number of um, players, all with good intentions, but very difficult to coordinate and, all, and sometimes bringing things that you don't really want. And, you know, how, how can that become a coordinated effort so that, you know, the, the, the inputs are really adding up to what's needed and there's not um, overlapping interests in, in your country? Yeah. Yes, uh, coordination is a big challenge, a very big challenge. Well, first of all, it's good that there is so much interest. Uh, and most of the interest is positive. But then a lot usually depends on the country themselves, being able to have clear strategies to which this interest can fit into. So that ball actually comes back to us do our countries have clear strategies, clear policies? Do we have structures for dialogue so that those uh, interests can be accommodated? And do we also have mechanisms for saying, not this one, take this away? The countries which are moving best in Africa, some of them, they say, eh, autocratic. Eritrea, Rwanda, Ethiopia. They are moving very well because they have got very structured societies and no nonsense. You, you, know, you come as a donor, you are not doing this, the way to the airport is over there. So I think that challenge is ours. But also uh, the, the, our partners from outside, they should recognize that if they really want lasting gains, it is better to work by building and entering into the local systems and strengthening uh, existing institutions. Thanks very much. And, and, and Francis, thank you. Uh, great presentation. I really um, had a similar question to, to, to Jack, actually. I was just trying to pull several piece of your, pieces of your, of your presentation together. So you, you, you started out, you talked about the importance of prevention. You also had a great slide that basically said politicians will we will only make the right decisions when you know, you've got the social mobilization to, to, to make it in their interest. So vilifying the lawmakers in, in Uganda for passing this bill, even if there was a quorum or not, as you say, it's being redrafted, is probably not going to be the way to attack this. The way to attack this is through social mobilization. And one of your final slides talked about patience. And I think 
Yes, we need to be patient, but we don't want to be quite as patient as we've been in our own countries that have taken an awfully long time to get on that road. We want to leapfrog. We want to leapfrog with development technologies and innovations, but we also want to leapfrog in, 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 in social mobilization. So you talk quite a lot about governance, um, and governance becomes a bit of a, a sticky conversation when one is talking about global uh, intergovernmentally negotiated goals. So the post-2015 development agenda, there is a proposed goal there that is around inclusive societies and accountable institutions. And many in the, in, in, in the G77 in Africa say, well, this is another word for conditionality, the old donor. And I don't think it is. I, and, and it's great to hear you talking about this. And, and I'm hopeful that a growing middle class and, and, and growth there will help. So my question is, what role do you think public-private partnerships have in, in, in trying to accelerate this, in trying to promote this social change, in trying to get more rapid uh, change? Because you talked about the challenges of governance in the UN and international organizations and global health <coughs> initiatives, some of which are public-private partnerships. So we've got a job to do in, in improving governance, and there's a job to be done there. But do you see you know, particular niches, opportunities for public-private partnerships to really help sort of leapfrog a little bit and so we don't have to be quite as patient as we otherwise might need to be. Mm. Thanks. Uh, uh, that's a, uh, you've, uh, thank you for getting my slides so well, including those points which I didn't mention but are written in the slides. That's why they were put there. So this might be an attempt to answer your question. First, we would like to see African economies grow. How can we do this. They say, I think our governments are open to the private sector coming in, and uh, um, we should be working with them and also working with uh, local African entrepreneurs. We say that the health of Africans, uh, rather the economy of Africa, should reflect our health challenges. Um, there is the African Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Plan created by the African Union, a very beautiful document. Do the Americans know about that? They, I think this, uh, we probably, we really need uh, ways of uh, getting institutionalized um, conversations between American private sector and the African private sector and the African governments. So, uh, um, uh, uh, how do we do this? I think being uh, risky, I think Laura talked about uh, uh, risk averse, or rather as opposite to, I think we, your people, need to come to Africa more to look at what is happening there. And the opportunities for doing that, I believe are there. I don't know what happened when the African heads of state were here uh, two months ago, two, three months ago. August, I think it was. Uh, I, we should uh, find a way of following that up. What did they decide? And how can we take that forward? Then this uh, uh, advocacy for good governance is very, very important. Uh, our head of state has been in power for uh, that long. He says he's voted for. Maybe he's voted for. Maybe he's not. Others are like that. But uh, it, it, we, we should uh, find global ways of getting, making sure that all countries and all, all particularly uh, public institutions are properly governed, including the UN system, because the UN system is, is important. Uh, that Ebola thing may not be like it is today if the UN system was more effective than it is. And if the local governments in those three countries were as effective as we would like them to be. And then this one of supporting uh, African uh, people like me and our institutions. I think if we get this right, then we will be able to hold our leaders more accountable. We will be able to generate with our own populations the solutions that fit our results. And if your private sector is also in there with us, then perhaps we have a good chance of moving forward together. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for your talk and for the questions. And we have a break now until 11.30. So uh, mix, add more questions, and we have Francis to, uh, to talk with. Thanks, Francis. <laughs>